It's always a joy to, for me to talk to folks about servant leadership. The reason is because it's the only leadership approach I know where you're guaranteed to get great results and great human satisfaction. Now you might say, really, Ken? Because when I talk to people in business about servant leadership, they often think I'm talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please people or some kind of religious movement. What they don't understand is that there's two parts of servant leadership. The first is vision and direction. See, leadership is about going somewhere. So if people don't know where you're going and where you want them to go, what's the chances of them getting there? Not very good. And so that role and the responsibility comes from the hierarchy. You got to be as a manager, as a president, and all. You got to make sure your people know what your vision is and what your goals are. And uh, if they do, then they got a chance to get there. Now, the second part of servant leadership is the servant part because the vision and direction is the leadership part. The servant part is you got to philosophically turn that instrument. Uh, that pyramid upside down because now you work for your people. Your job is to help them live according to the vision and accomplish the goals. And so you have the leadership part of servant leadership and the servant part. Now let me just give you an example. I had a wonderful time writing a book with Colleen Barrett, uh, who was president of, of Southwest Airlines. She's now president of Meritus. And one of the reasons why Southwest has been the only airline really in the last 40 years to make a profit is that everybody knows what their vision is and what the goals are. Now, a compelling vision, and I wrote a book with Jesse Stoner about that, has three parts. First of all, what is your purpose? What business are you in? And it's really interesting. If you ask almost anybody in Southwest Airline what business they're in, they'll tell you we're in the customer service business. We happen to, to uh, fly airplanes. Uh, the second part of a compelling vision is your picture of the future. If you do a really great job, what will happen? And in Southwest Airlines, their picture of the future is that they will democratize the airway. Their goal is that every American can be with a friend or a relative in a happy time and a sad time. That's why they're a low-cost airline. And that's something you can get excited about uh, for people. And then the third key part of a compelling vision is what are your values? What's going to drive uh, your behavior? And in Southwest, they have four uh, values. Safety is number one because of the business they're in. But then they have three values that they want everybody to engage in every single day. The first one is a warrior spirit, and that doesn't mean combative. What it really means is if you got a job, do it. That's why they can turn a, a plane around in 10 minutes or so faster than anybody in the business, because pilots are in there throwing out garbage with the rest of them. They don't say, that's not my job, and all that kind of thing. Uh, the second value that they have is what they call a servant's heart. And I've never seen another organization with that as a value, and the servant's heart really says, we're going to hire for character and train for skills. Now, they're going to put a pilot up there who can't fly, but they're also not going to put a pilot up there who thinks they're a big deal. In fact, one of the stories when I was working on it, there was a, a top pilot in one of the big airlines, you know, wanted to work with Southwest because you know, they all want to work with Southwest. And the word was that he was rude to the staff on the Southwest flight down to Dallas. And then when he got to the corporate headquarters, <clears throat> when you walk in there, they have this beautiful sign, big sign that says, we the people of uh, Southwest and talks about all of the uh, appreciation of their people. And they have wonderful, a couple of wonderful receptionists there. And he kind of blew them off. And this one gal called upstairs and said, I don't know why this guy's here, but let me tell you how he treated me. And I got a call from the folks on the airline and he didn't treat them very well, too. They didn't even interview him. You know, uh, and said, maybe you can learn from some, something like this. We're not putting a pilot up that can't fly, but we're not putting a pilot up that, that isn't there to serve rather than to be served. And then the, the final value they have <coughs> is a fun-loving attitude. And uh, that's really kind of uh, fun. That's, that's the Herb Kelleher, the founder. He just loves to have fun. I had a friend a while back that was flying in Southwest, and the, and the uh, airline attendant got on the phone. He said, this is the last flight of the day, and, you know, we're really tired. We don't have energy to pass out the peanuts and the potato chips, so we're going to put them on the floor up front. 
uh, and when we take off and get some height, they'll come down the the uh, the, the thing. And if you want to, you'll get it. Everybody's laughing and grabbing the peanuts and all that kind of thing. I landed, uh, had a really hard landing in Southwest a while back, and the guy gets on the microphone. He said, you probably wonder what caused that hard landing. He said, I talked to the pilot, and he said it wasn't his fault. It was Ash's fault. And uh, so, I mean, they like to really have fun. See, now, once you have a compelling vision, then you can put goals on that that, that play into to that. And so many companies don't have that. You know, and if they have a mission statement, it's this big wordy thing. I was working with a big bank a while back, and I said, thanks for sending me your mission statement when I got in front of the president, the chairman, everybody, because I slept so much better since I got it. You know, because if I couldn't sleep, I put it next to my bed at night, and I would, you know, read your mission statement. I said, we're in this business, you know, and I just put me right to sleep. I told him, I said, I think your mission, your purpose, and your reason for being is, is that you're in the financial peace of mind business, and if I gave you money, I would have peace of mind, you take care of it and grow it. I mean, so you need to really simplify things so people can understand both what your purpose is, where you're trying to head in terms of, uh, of if you do a good job, and then what are the values that guide your journey, and then the goals. And the responsibility, I said, for that leadership part is from the leader. Now, once that's done, <clears throat> now you turn the pyramid upside down. And now everybody's working for everybody who eventually works for the frontline people who are closest to the customers. And you know, you can always tell an organization that's run by a self-serving leader, because if you got a problem with there's a customer and you go to them, then you got a duck, you know, going quack, 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 you know, it's our policy, quack, quack, I just work here, quack, quack, I didn't make the rules, quack, 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 do you want to talk to my supervisor and all that kind of thing, PC, because they haven't turned the pyramid upside down and everybody's sucking up the hierarchy. So if there's a conflict between what a customer wants and what your supervisor want, wants, the supervisor wins, see? And what you really want is when you turn that pyramid upside down with eagles, you permit people to bring their brains to work and they can soar like eagles rather than quack like ducks. I mean, my favorite Southwest story is when I travel, I have this thing I put around my neck, I call it my geezer pouch. You know, you get older, you lose things and all. And in my geezer pouch, I can put my license, my passport if I need it, my itinerary, you know, pen and pencil and all. And I go around the airport, what do you need? And all. I've been trying to get my wife Margie to have one because she can't find anything in her pocketbook. Uh, but one day I loaded that beauty up and I left it on my desk uh, in Escondido at, in my home and I pull it into the San Diego airport and it's about two years after 9-11 so they're a little uptight about identification and I found out I have no official identification. I didn't have time to go back home uh, to get one, so uh, get the geezer pouch and so the only book I've ever written that I got my picture on the cover is the book I wrote with Don Shula, the old Miami Dolphins coach, called Everyone's a Coach. And so I ran into the bookstore at the uh, airport, and luckily they had a copy, and I bought it. And fortunately, the first airline I went to was Southwest. I said, could I see your identification? I said, gee, I don't have a license, I don't have a passport. How's this? And I held the book up, and the guy looked at it, and he started out, this man knows Don Shula! Put him in first class. Of course, they didn't even have first class then, or even, you know, business select. And they're high five me in the street. The way I go, Shula, you know, and all. And there's an older guy there who says, uh, you know, I can get you through the security guards upstairs, and which he did. I mean, why is that possible? When I talked to Colleen, she says, we let our people use their brains. You know, he didn't assume that you had superposed your picture on this book. And, all. And, that, and anyway, the bigger issue is whether you have weapons or not. Now, the next airline I had to go to, one of the biggies here uh, in this uh, country, and I showed my uh, book out at the street to check my bag, and I tell you, the duck doo-doo started to fly, you know. Quack, you better talk to the, the gal at the ticket counter. And I showed her, she said, quack, you better talk to my supervisor. We always call the supervisory duck the head mallard, you know, because they just quack at a higher level. And so suddenly I'm talking to a guy in a coat and a tie. I must have been three levels up or more in the thing. And, you know, I started to give him a hard time, but I could see immediately this guy was a bureaucrat. You can always tell bureaucrats they have really tight underwear, you know, and they kind of waddle along, you know, and all that kind of thing. So I said to him, oh, what a difficult job you have. I so appreciate you taking my case into consideration. 
I mean, we have to go through these gyrations when we're dealing with ducks, you know, and he finally let me on the, on the plane. But you see, with servant leadership, the thing really comes alive. Now, when in terms of working with people one-on-one, -on -one, what is the vision and direction? It's making sure you have clear goals with your people. All good performance starts with clear goals. In fact, there's three parts of managing people's performance on a day-to-day -day basis. There's performance planning, when you agree on the goals and objectives. Then there's day-to-day -day coaching, where you work with them to help them accomplish their goals. And then there's performance evaluation. In most organizations, where do they spend the most time uh, of those three, planning, coaching, or evaluation. When I talk to people, they all go, it's evaluation, you know. I mean, they got to fill out all these stupid forms on everybody, you know, all that kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of organizations don't even have goals, but if they do, they usually file them, you know, until somebody says you got your annual performance review, and everybody's, oh, my God, where are the goals? And they're running around bumping into each other trying to find the goals. And the least of those three, planning, coaching, and evaluation, is day-to-day -day coaching. And yet when you're a servant leader, the performance planning is about the leadership part of servant leadership because you're making sure that they have clear goals and all. And then when you get to day-to-day -day coaching, you're turning the pyramid upside down. Now all your effort is to help them win. Uh, so when they get to the annual performance review, they get a good uh, evaluation. See, in so many organizations, that's not the goal. You know, they have these uh, normal distribution curves, you know, where you're supposed to screw a certain percentage of your people. You know, I ask people all the time, how many of you go out and hire new losers every year? We, just, we lost some of our best losers last year. We now need to hire some new ones to fill the low slots. No, you go out and you either hire winners you steal from other companies or you hire potential winners who you think of. You're not hiring a normal distribution curve or don't do Jack Welsh's, you know, <laughs> you know rank order. That's a big morale uh, builder, rank order in your, your people. Now, when I was a college professor, uh, for 10 years, I taught Ohio University for four years and six years at the University of Massachusetts. I was always in trouble because the first day of class, I always handed out the final examination. And the faculty would say, what are you doing? I say, I'm confused. They say, you acted. I said, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids. You are, but don't give them the questions in the final. And I said, not only am I going to give them the questions in the final, what do you think I'm going to do all semester? I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get the final exam, they get A. Life's all about getting A, as I said, not some stupid normal distribution curve. And so we have a wonderful master's degree program at University of San Diego where the students come for one three-day weekend a month for two years and one week each summer. Uh, it's a master of science and executive leadership. And in, in our first cohort, Gary Ridge was in it, who was the president of WD-40. When I told that story about giving the final exam out the first day of class, Gary went, duh, why don't we do that in industry? And so he set up in WD-40 a system he called uh, don't mark my paper, help me get an A. And uh, we ended up writing a book about it t together called Help People uh, Win at Work. And what they do at WD-40 at the beginning of the fiscal year, every manager sits down with each of their direct reports. They call themselves the WD-40 tribe, so it's a tribe leader and a tribe member. And first they look at the organizational goals, and then they look at what the person's responsibilities are. And then they set four or five observable, measurable goals. They've got to be observable, measurable, <clears throat> so you can track performance. And once those goals are set, now what happens is the, the pyramid gets turned upside down, and now it's the job of the people to help them win. Now, one of the fascinating things about WD-40 is once a quarter, uh, every single quarter, they have a meeting with every tribe leader and every tribe member uh, and the first question at the beginning of the meeting is the final exam still relevant? Because, you know, are those four or five goals still relevant? A lot of times we will file goals and then there's a tsunami, there's an economic uh, downturn, and people are not working on those goals for six months, and all of a sudden they're being evaluated on it, or they're evaluated on stupid things like initiative, you know, willingness to take responsibility, promotability, I love that one. You know, nobody knows what that means, so they, what they do, they suck up the hierarchy because they know the boss, you know, can only give so many A's. At WD-40, 
the, the whole goal is to get as many people A's as possible. Now, what's really interesting is they have a report card that says first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, overall performance. And uh, in a lot of organizations, uh, here's the managers filling out all these forms and their people, and the people outside wondering how well I did. At WD-40, everybody only fills out one performance review, their own. And at the beginning of that quarterly meeting, after they decide whether the goals are still relevant, because they can change the goals all the way up to the beginning of the fourth quarter, the direct report, the tribe member gives their tribe leader their report card, and they put in the report card A, B, C, or L. L means I'm still learning, so don't evaluate me uh, on it. And now what is the job of the manager is to agree or disagree with how they rated it. You know, sometimes people rate it a little bit too high, you know, because they've been in better organizations that you better rate it high because they're going to slam you uh, eventually. And then some people, you know, aren't just confident and they rate themselves low. And it's the manager to say, no, I, I really think that uh, that's not a B. That looks like an A. Look at the data. Or sometimes they might say, no, I don't think that's quite an A yet. I think it's a B. But the goal is, is how do you get as many people to accomplish their goals, see? And at WD-40, you know, if a manager comes to Gary or one of the top managers and says, this person's not working out, I'm going to fire him. The first question is, what did you do to help him get an A? And if they broke meetings and all, they'll fire the manager, not the direct report. They only had to do that a couple of times. Now people really get it, you know, and, and all. And so this is really powerful. This is about servant leadership in action because the goals are really clear and the, the direct report uh, doesn't, uh, gets involved in setting the goals, but it's the responsibility of the tribe leader to make sure goals are clear. And once that's done, that's the leadership part of servant leadership, they turn it upside down and now they're serving and their whole goal is to help them win. Now, isn't that tremendous? Now, I'm having some fun playing around with a book that's entitled, Duh, which is why is in common sense common practice? Because as I look at all the leaders in major fields, whether you're talking about Chick-fil-A in the quick service business, whether you're talking about Synovus in financial services, they won the best company to work for by fortune so often, they said stop applying and they formed an all-star list. If you look at Nordstrom's in, in retail, you look at uh, Southwest in the airline business, you look in Disney and the, the park business and all. They are all managed with a philosophy of servant leadership. They have very clear goals and everybody knows what they're being asked to do. And then the job of the managers is to help them accomplish those goals and win. Life is about winning and helping people. So I want to tell you, if you really want to make a difference in your organization, you want great results and great human satisfaction, Go for servant leadership, because let me just tell you about WD-40 one last time. They have an internal customer satisfaction survey they give out every 18 months. And if you pass those out, and a lot of you are in HR, you know if you get 50 or 60 return rate, you're lucky. They get 98% return at WD-40, and they're in 60 nations. The last time they passed it out, the number one response was 98.7 said, I'm proud to tell people I work for WD-40. 98.5 said, at WD-40, I'm clear on what I'm being asked to do. I think 98.4 said, at WD-40, I'm getting the help I need uh, to be a winner. And so people love to work there and, and go look at their stock uh, price. Their performance is incredible. So it's human satisfaction and great results. They come together with servant leader. It's not about the inmates running the prison. It's not about pleasing people. It's about operating in a way that makes sense that'll help your organization win and you win.